Thanks. So this talk is about why it's important to optimize the tricky parts and some of the lessons we've learned from doing Ruby about where it's important to spend the time focusing on optimizations for a dynamic language. I also work for Oracle, so the same safe harbor disclosure is just a, a research project. It's not ready for people to actually use yet. So I'm going to be talking about Ruby. Ruby is an imperative language. Ten years ago, it probably would have been called a scripting language. That's probably a little bit unfair and outmoded these days. Uh, Ruby powers behemoth websites like GitHub. It used to power uh, Twitter. So it's used for really large-scale enterprise applications. So uh, the scripting language is playing it down a bit, I think. The scripting side of it comes from Perl, but people don't really use the Perlisms anymore. People use it more like a small talk language these days. So it's object orientated. Everything's an object, including primitive numbers and things like that. Um, people write explicit classes in it, um, rather than prototypes as in JavaScript. Ruby is very much a batteries included language. You get quite a large standard library of it. That's in contrast to languages like JavaScript, and it's more like languages like Python, where you get lots and lots of features and libraries built into the language. Um, and they're usually shipped as part of the implementation, past the interpreter, so not be implemented in the implementation language. Um, and those libraries do lots and lots of important things. This is some example Ruby code, um, just a, a random snippet from Rails. Rails is the, the big Ruby web framework that lots of people use. Um, to a lot of people, Ruby is Rails, that's how important it is. And as you can see, it, it's pretty easy to understand. If you don't know Ruby, you can just squint and pretend this is Python or JavaScript. And if there are important differences, I'll point them out. But if you don't know Ruby, don't let yeah, to, uh, that phase you. You can just pretend it's something else. Ruby is quite unusual in that there are quite a few, or have been quite a few, historically good implementations of Ruby. So other languages like uh, Python or Lua, there's generally one main implementation. And in Ruby, there's been a lot over the years. The main one is called MRI for Matz's Ruby interpreter. Matz is the creator of Ruby. It's a very simple bytecode interpreter. It used to be an AST interpreter implemented in C. And only in the last uh, uh, six or seven years, I think, became a, a bytecode interpreter and, and got a little bit faster. And it's implemented in C. And the core library, all of that, almost all of that built-in stuff, is implemented in C. So one C function per Ruby method. There's two main competing alternative implementations of Ruby. Um, there's JRuby. This is JRuby. This is Ruby implemented on top of the JVM, written in Java. It does have a JIT. It JITs by emitting JVM bytecode at runtime. So it creates classes dynamically at runtime and passes them to JVM. And of all the languages which do that, and there's quite a lot of JVM languages do that, I think JRuby is probably the most sophisticated by quite a long way. When they modified the, the JVM specification several years ago to add better support for dynamic languages, uh, JRuby was the main use case for doing that. So we could even go so far as to say that the JVM has been to some extent redesigned and specialized to better support JRuby. And over time, they've added more and more complex stuff. They now actually have their own IR that's done before they emit bytecode. So they have a conventional data flow graph, control flow graph IR that they do some optimizations on before they emit bytecode. So it really is quite sophisticated. The only other language which emits bytecode at runtime, which is more sophisticated, is now Nashorn, but that was done by Oracle. Um, at runtime. At run, yeah. right. In JRuby, the core library is mostly implemented in Java. <coughs> When they started, they literally translated the, the runtime from C into Java and just started using that. The other main alternative implementation of Ruby is called Rubinius. Rubinius is based on the Blue, took, Blue Book implementation of Smalltalk that Mario showed us on Tuesday. And this jits by emitting LLVM IR. So LLVM is a compiled infrastructure as a library, and you can emit IR for that. It's fairly low-level IR and that uh, produces machine code. The VM itself is written in C++, but really interestingly, the core library, that batteries is including stuff, is actually implemented in Ruby, in Rubinius, to some extent. Um, and both JRuby and Rubinius are actually used in production. They're not just toy implementations on the sidelines. They're actually fairly heavily used. My implementation of Ruby that I want to talk about today is a combination of JRuby and Rubinius. It's called JRuby plus Truffle, and it uses the Truffle framework, which uh, Gilles introduced and I'll talk more about, and it uses the Graal compiler. 
So we call it Joe Ruby plus truffle. <coughs> it's an interesting story about language implementation and the difficulty of writing VMs that both Joe Ruby and Rubinius had to implement almost everything they did from scratch. So they both wrote their own Alexa, they both, both wrote their own parser. Uh, Rubinius has its own bytecode written from scratch, it has a JIT which uses LLVM, but it has its own primitives, its own core library, and Joe Ruby had to implement their own intermediate representation, their own bytecode generator, their own core library. Um, and this is why implementing VMs is difficult and takes so long. We have to do all these steps pretty much from scratch to build up anything that even achieves any kind of reasonable level of performance. J plus Truffle combines elements of these. So we took the Lexer and the Parser from JRuby, and we took lots of other support routines from JRuby, um, but we wrote our own AST using the Truffle framework. And we wrote our own core library using some of the core library from Rubinius. So it's a mixture of the two. J plus Truffle isn't a toy implementation of Ruby. It's still uh, not quite ready for general use yet, but it isn't just a, a research prototype. We actually support 100% of the the language specifications, the, the test suite that's been produced to run with Ruby. And this is more than JRuby and Rubinius have achieved. So we support literally everything that anyone has thought is useful to write a test about for the library we do. And we're at 90% of compatibility with the core library. And this gives you an idea about the, the scale of the core library. We've been working on it for three years. We've reused some of the core library from Rubinius, and we're still in it at 90%. It, it's huge, the core library. I don't want to talk too much about benchmarks, but just to give you a sort of idea of scale, this is several implementations of Ruby. So this is a recent version of MRI. In blue is JRuby using the advanced invoke dynamic technology. And, and taller is faster. Taller is faster, yes, and it goes up um, three to seven. Uh, gray is Rubinius, so that's LLVM. Uh, green is Topaz, so that's using a technique called meta tracing and R Python, which I think Carl could be talking about um, tomorrow. And we're here in purple, and the little ticks are error bars. This is for a set of five or six of the synthetic um, shootout benchmarks. So benchmarks, most of us probably know pretty well. And we do, it looks like we do really well here. Joby and Rubinius managed to make an improvement over MRI, but it's pretty modest. Topaz does really well, and we're above that. But this is on the shootout benchmarks. Often people will say, well, you do fantastic on the shootout benchmarks, that's great, but what about real applications? Well, one really interesting research result we found from this project is actually we can do much better on real code. This is a set of about 40 kernels, so they are the kernels of applications, the, the, the tighter loops inside them, from two important libraries, which are Chunky PNG and uh, PSD.RB. They are for processing Photoshop files and PNG files. These are compute-intensive benchmarks, that's true, but they are also things that people are using to make money in business today. So this is deployed and in use. And when we run on these, these gems rather than the synthetic benchmarks, we're way, way, way above everyone else at around 65, 70 times faster. And part of this talk has been explaining why that is. Why are we able to do that? What are we doing differently? Where's the, this is obviously, we've broken through a kind of barrier here to achieve this. One of the questions I often get asked by people in the Ruby community is why aren't you using more of JRuby? Uh, they've done so much work to implement the Ruby core library in Java and we're not reusing most of that. And I'm going to use this as the backbone for explaining the optimizations we've done. And the, the thesis is that the, the core library of Ruby is what it's actually important to optimize, not the basic language constructs. And you need to optimize them at a very deep level um, much more than anyone else has done to achieve that kind of performance. So let's talk about what makes Ruby difficult to optimize. Um, it's got the same challenges as JavaScript, the same basic challenges as the, it comes in in source code form, it's a dynamic language, it doesn't have explicit types, um, but it's more than that. It's about how do people want to write Ruby. I'm going to philosophize here for a second. And a lot of people who do work on language implementations spend a lot of time disparaging the languages and the people who program in them. And I can understand that because it's often very frustrating when you work with these languages. But the philosophy I'm trying to take is that whatever code people want to write, I'll try and get that running as fast as possible. So what I'm going to show here is not a criticism of anyone's programming style or programming ability. It's a, an empirical observation of how people choose to write Ruby. 
This is an implementation of a clamp routine, and it's from the, the uh, Photoshop processing library. So clamp a, a, a number between a minimum and a maximum. And the way they've chosen to implement this is they've created an array literal here, literal here with the values. They've sorted it, which produces a new array with them sorted. And then they take the middle one, uh, index one being the middle one. So that's a, a valid implementation of sort. It may not be how you would choose to implement sort if you're writing a low-level language or trying to achieve performance. And this routine is used for clamping pixel values. So it's called many times for each pixel in potentially very large Photoshop and PNG files. So it needs to be high performance. That's how they chose to write it. So we could criticize them for that. Rather, they've used high level um, operations, they've used core library routines rather than using low level stuff. Um, and if you look here, there's no low level language constructs at all. There's a call to the array constructor, there's a call to sort, and then array in indexing, as all operations are in Ruby, almost all, is a method call. So we have method call, method call, method call. Um, so there's very little scope for applying to just that code, conventional compiler optimizations. But it gets worse. This is a, a modification to the range class, range being you know, between a low value and a high value. Um, and this modifies it to add a, an extra method called include. Question marks can be part of method names in, in Ruby. And it gives it a value to see if it's included. Now, ranges in Ruby can be exclusive end or inclusive end. Um, so they check that here. What they decide to do, though, is based on that, they say, well, I've used the less than operator or the less than equals operator. This syntax here is simply a, an intern string. So this colon means an intern string. And then they call send using metaprogramming to pass that operator in. So this seems like an innocent inner loop sort of operation that it should be high performance. And here actually we're using metaprogramming um, based on control flow to choose a method um, to call that. Another example of here, this here, this is a method that's added to the, the object class. Um, it's a blank method. It tells you whether something's empty or whether it's nil or false or something like that. Um, and they want to call this empty method, which is on some classes but not others. So they first check, does it respond to empty? So again, it's like we're using metaprogramming or reflection. And again, blank is something you can imagine using innocently within an inner loop and expecting to be high performance and potentially not being so. This is, again, part of the inner loop of that graphics processing. So it's hard mix, which is a Photoshop filter between a foreground color and a background color. There are some options and things like that. What we're doing here that's interesting is we have this method R, G, and B to extract those um, values from the, the packed pixel. But there are no methods R, G, or B. What they've done is they've defined a fallback method missing, and they said if this other module has that method, then go and call it. So rather than using a module in a normal way to import that method, they've decided to do this. Again, that's probably not ideal programming style, but that is what the, the Ruby code that is out there that we'd like to run is like. So that's what we want to try and accommodate. This is a really common pattern. It's a duration, and it's a, a, a facade class. So it wraps a, a value, a time value, and it provides some extra methods but then if you call a method which isn't defined directly on that class, it passes it directly to the value, so it passes it through the, <coughs> through the facade. Um, and again, you think you get a duration class and you're using it to do timing stuff, you think it's high performance, and actually this is how it, it's implemented. Getting more extreme. This is for decoding the grayscale entry from a, a, a palette um, for a particular bit depth, because it, how it's packed depends on the bit depth. What we're doing here is we're using send again to call PNG resample, but there are different methods depending on the bit depth. So what this syntax here is doing is it's a string and it's interpolating this variable bit depth into it. So it's calling different versions of the methods based on the different bit depth and it's passing that to send. So we are at runtime creating a string and then doing this dynamic call. Eval is very common in Ruby. Um, this is a delegate method which tries to speed up that pattern of passing um, code through. What it does is it defines a method with a name 
and it's called once for each method that's on the, the value you've wrapped and gives you an extra method with it. Um, and then it defines that using eval. Templating is a really common thing to do in Ruby. So generating an HTML template from some values. And again, that uses eval. The templates are compiled to Ruby code and then we eval that with some, some particular runtime values. So each, people talk about eval, it should be something which should be avoided. The reality of a, a Ruby web application, which is processing an image and returning an HTML page, is that it's calling eval for every single request. And it's calling method missing seven times for each pixel in the image it's processing, et cetera, et cetera. But why can't a conventional VM optimize this? Why can't we make JRuby, why can't JRuby make this as fast as we want? And we know that it, it's, uh, the, the amount it achieves in speeding this up is very limited from that first, uh, from that second graph we saw. There are several key problems here. And they're all to do with the implementation of the core library that's inside JRuby. And the first problem is JRuby's core library is megamorphic. It handles everything at every time. So this is the implementation of add. So you remember I said that every operation is a method call in Ruby. So when you call add, you make a method call. And you can add a, a fixed num, a small integer, to another fixed num or a big num or a float or something else entirely. And they have all these cases written in here. <coughs> you think that um, things like speculative optimizations would help here, uh, the sort of things that Gilles talked about. But the problem is that this stuff is already behind a invoke dynamic call. And it's already several method calls deep away from where the, the function, where the method call started from. Um, and the reality, I think, is that Hotspot could conceivably optimize this kind of stuff to replace the ones that aren't being used here with guards. But in practice, it does not. The second problem is that JRuby's core library is stateless. A lot of people in this, uh, this meetup have talked about the importance of things like caching and about storing profiled state and what you've seen before. But JRuby's core library isn't able to do that. Because they implement every Ruby method as one Java method, um, when they come to the implementation of something like send, remember send was where we could call a method based on a string name, they can look up a method, but there's nowhere for them to store the information. They're inside a method activation, and there's nowhere for them to say, this is our cache of what we've seen before. So their implementation of send looks up the method from scratch every single time. Now you could have a global method cache, but that sort of thing gets overwhelmed so quickly that it becomes next to useless. There's nowhere for them to store the information they want to for next time. Compounding this is the problem that JRuby's core library is very deep. These core library routines don't just do one little thing. Um, they may call back into your Ruby code. They may have to convert types, etc., etc., and it just keeps going down this rabbit hole. If we look at a, an example like sort, and remember sort was being used inside that tight clamp method that we wanted to optimize. So JRuby's sort, um, it calls this sort internal, and sort internal calls quick sort, and it constructs and passes in a comparator object which calls back into Ruby. And we, we said that we had nowhere to store something like a cache when we're just in a normal Java method. Well, it's even worse here. We're in one Java method, we've called another, we're inside something we've just allocated as a comparator, and there's certainly nowhere to store state by the time we get to there. And we're even further away from the, the method call. And we're, if, we wanted, if we were to expect Hotspot to inline this uh, effectively, we're expecting it to inline through many, many, many methods to get, even get this far, let alone the complexity of the actual sort routine when it gets here. Even if all the inputs to this quick sort sort routine are constant, um, there's no way Hotspot is going to partially evaluate, constant fold, remove all that extra overhead. It's just not going to happen at the moment. Again, combating that is that JRuby's call line isn't amenable to optimization. This sort routine is just includes too much stuff and too much stuff that defeats escape analysis, um, too much stuff that's generic and megamorphic. I said that Rubinius implemented much of the core library in um, Ruby, and that seems like a really good solution to the problem. Many VMs start to implement functionality in the, the guest language itself. 
So Rubinius has most of the core library implemented in, in Ruby. And JavaScript is starting to do this in, in many implementations. And Java, of course, most of the JDK standard library is implemented in Java. This is part of uh, Rubinius's sort routine. And this looks good. This looks like this is normal Ruby code. So if we have normal inline caches, we can put this in here. We can cache calls, etc. cetera. Um, but the problem is that the, the, the implementation in Ruby has to bottom out somewhere. Unless you're going to implement your integers using church new rules, you have to at some point reach some kind of genuine primitive. And unfortunately, that happens very, very soon, and it becomes a barrier. This is implementation of fixed num compare, which is the, uh, the call being made here. This is implemented for fixed nums here, and it's a C++ method. The Rubinius JIT has no knowledge of these C++ methods. All it knows is it's a code address it can jump to and call. Even if you compile Rubinius with LLVM, that doesn't matter because of it's compiled statically and then you're generating code at runtime, but it can't compile through the code that's already compiled. It is possible perhaps we could in the future generate something that ships the LLVM IR with it, but that's not something that's being done at the moment, so we'll, we'll discard that for the moment. Um, and so this becomes a, another barrier to, to doing any kind of optimizations. Um, and this is something really simple. You know, this isn't a, a complex operation. This is just comparing to integers. When all the, the bottom leaf operations are implemented like this, you very quickly find that you still can't do anything. And this is done in other systems. Um, this is array copy. You may have used system.array copy from Java. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this modifier before, native. It means that it's a, a primitive, which is then called from the runtime, much in the same way as the Rubinius code is. The difference here is that in the Java, there's very few of these, comparatively. Um, and that means that we could implement compiler knowledge of each of these relatively easily. So the Graal compiler can have a special node for array copy that it can optimize and see through. We can't do that for every single Ruby method. OK, let's take an interlude and talk about Truffle and Graal. And I'll talk about them from a language implementer's perspective rather than the, uh, the, the Graal implemented perceptor of Gilles. So we have Hotspot. It's a, a fantastic piece of technology, very powerful. People have written many successful languages on top of it. But as a language implementer, someone implementing something like JRuby, it is just a black box. And all you can do is give it things. So when JRuby emits, uh, emits bytecode, all it does is pour bytecode into the top and there's, there's, there's very little else it can do. It knows that somewhere in there is a, a JIT compiler, and people like uh, Charles Nutter, who work on JRuby, are very knowledgeable how, about how this process works, but they still can't do anything because they've got no levers, they've got no lights telling them what's going on. And the, the path that the bytecode needs to take to get to the JIT is very tortuous, and there's no guarantee even that the, the code that they're pouring in will get compiled. Um, it could just be ignored. So when you're using the JVM as a, to implement guest languages, you have this, this path where you have a, a piece of code, you generate an AST, you emit JVM bytecode, and you get machine code out, and the idea is that the hotspot take care, takes care of that, all you need to do is emit the bytecode. So you need to do two of these stages. But making sure that happens, making sure that a, a good output has proved very difficult. What we're doing in the, the Graal project, in the VM research group at Oracle Labs, is we have re-implemented the, the compiler, the JIT compiler that is inside Hotspot normally, as a Java application. And it's a normal Java library. Um, and that means that you can use it as a normal Java library. So instead of just pouring things into the top of it, you can more finely tune stuff. You can get things out of it. You can de-optimize. You can control what's going on. That's hard to do. That requires specialist knowledge. So Truffle is the layer on top of that. Truffle talks to Graal back and forth on your behalf and lets you just implement things in an easy way. So let's talk about that, that easy way to implement things. The model in Truffle is that you implement an AST interpreter, which is what an undergraduate would probably implement if you asked them to implement an interpreter. The, the novel idea is that it's a self-specializing AST interpreter. So when you start emitting your program, you emit each node in your AST as an uninitialized node that could handle anything. Or perhaps I should say could handle, can handle nothing. 
And the idea is that as the program runs, you can replace the nodes with specialized nodes that do what you want. So the easiest example is types. So if you see, if you're an add node and you see two integers, then you make yourself into an integer add node. And we have this, this lattice of types so that um, there's an uninitialized at the top and then we might have string or double or integer, and maybe integer can go to double, but they all move down towards a, a bottom point so they converge on something that's stable eventually. So if your program really is megamorphic, then we have a, a megamorphic node which can handle anything. Uh, this is a, 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 a DAG, so it all goes, goes downwards. I'll show you what this looks like in practice. I don't want to uh, give you a truffle tutorial, but just to make, make you understand what this looks like in Java, what we have here is a, an, a class, which is a simple language add node. Simple languages are demonstrator language. And you write a method for each of the types you might expect. So this can add together two longs, or two big integers, or two strings. Um, the, the strings, they're just objects, and then we can write a guard that says, is it a string? And the guard's implemented there. So it's almost like uh, multi-methods, if you've heard that term, um, or multiple dispatch. So the specialization, which is cool, depends on the types which went in. But it's not just about types. We often emphasize types in Truffle, and really you can specialize for anything you like. So this, this next example is quite complicated. Don't worry about understanding it. I just want to show you how far it can go. This is the eval node from simple language. And what this does is there's a specialization here which caches the code it's seen previously and the compiled version of it. So at cached means that this takes a, a mime type and a piece of code and it caches that mime type and it caches that code and it caches the result of passing it into an AST. And then the next time it can simply call that. And then we have guards to say that it hasn't changed. So it's not just types, you can, you can specialize and cache and, um, ca and specialize for any, anything you like. Specialize at the time of day if you want to. That sounds a bit slow though, these uh, AST interpreters. Because it's all Java methods making Java method calls. So what we do is we compile that AST using partial evaluation into a single piece of efficient machine code. So we literally take the bodies of all the methods involved in your AST, inline them into one, apply lots of optimizations, partial escape analysis, that sort of thing, and produce a single piece of machine code. Personally, I think partial evaluation is easily explained as just inlining and constant folding. I'm sure there's a more technical distinction, but that's how I explain it to most people. If you want to know more about partial evaluation, there's a great talk by Tom Stewart called Compilers for Free. It's for a non-technical Ruby audience, but uh, if you want to learn the basics of it, it's great. So we have this pipeline. We go from the AST, we become specialized, and we emit um, compiled code. But we talked about speculative optimizations. So we've made lots of speculative optimizations here. Obviously, we've speculated that the fact that the types aren't going to change. So we can reverse this. And we can go from the compiled AST back into the, the real AST that's mutable. We can change our nodes, we can re-specialize, and then we can compile again. So we can re-specialize, perhaps these are now doubles rather than just integers, and we can compile back to code. Obviously we have mechanisms to stop this just happening eternally in a loop. The fact that the specializations are a lattice means it always moves down, hopefully, to some convergent point. So this is the second half of the pipeline. We can de-optimize, we can keep updating, and we can recompile again. So you get all the benefits of um, producing really efficient machine code, but the only bit you have to do is, is these bits. The only bit you have to do is worry about updating your AST. The de-optimization, the recompilation is all done for you, and it's done more or less transparently as well. Truffle does other things for you. <coughs> Obviously, your ASTs form a kind of forest because there's lots of them um, in different methods and they all call each other. And Truffle can automatically do things such as if there's a particularly frequently executed call, it can inline that. And inlining is really simple to understand here. You simply take the AST and copy and paste it, and instead of being a call, you add a normal edge to it, and that becomes a, uh, an inline function. We talked about specializing, and one of the problems with specializing can be that... Um, things become megamorphic or generic very quickly. When I talked about not being able to add any kind of state or cache to JRuby's core library implemented in Java, even if they could, 
the risk would be that it would become specialised super quickly. So send would see 10 different methods in the first millisecond of running, and it would simply say, I can't cache this anymore. Um, and this is the problem we have here. If we have a method which specialises beautifully, but it's being bombarded with both integers and doubles and big integers, it's going to become megamorphic. And Truffle, again, can automatically fix this problem for you in that it can split. It can generate multiple copies of the same method and then let them specialise independently. And Truffle actually um, keeps track of how much it thinks trees cost. So if it sees that there's, there's lots of multiple copies of different specialisations going on, it'll automatically say, oh, I'll split these for you and I'll keep splitting them. Um, and so each of these then become nice and tightly, statically typed, if you like. And then inlining still applies. So we can actually inline that one specialised copy into where it's being called. This gets around the fact that in Ruby everything's a, a method call. We don't need to do anything special to get around that. We simply have lots of copies of those method calls and we let them specialise and be inlined. And it's just like having the primitive there normally. Um, and of course we can de-optimise to fix it if that turns out to be incorrect. So we said the model on the JVM with guest languages normally is you have some source code, you miss an AST, you have byte code, and then machine code is missed for you. Well, in Truffle and Graal, both those last steps are done for you, and all you need to do is write an AST interpreter. I'm selling it a little bit long here, in that re in reality, you do have to do quite a lot of tuning to make it a really high-performance interpreter. But I think it's very honest to say that you could get reasonably fast very, very easily. And then you can get extremely fast with a bit more specialist knowledge. Um, and, and Joe plus Truffle is the fastest implementation of Ruby by far, with reasonable effort. A few students working for a few years. Truffle and Guar, I said they were research projects. You probably want to know if, you, if they're available to be used for real. <coughs> uh, one of the interesting things about the way Graal is developing is that the stack that we're getting. Um, so we have Hotspot at the bottom, which is of course implemented in C++. And everything else on top of that is implemented in Java. So Graal is implemented in Java, and there's just a small little place where it needs to interface into Hotspot. The interface is really simple, actually. It's, uh, it's not much more than, here's some metadata, give me a byte array of machine code back to install. And then on top of Graal, we have Truffle, and then the, the language is implemented using Truffle on top of that. So there's a, a JavaScript implementation, there's an R implementation, um, and I work on a Ruby implementation, and there, there are others. What should happen is that in Java 9, that little interface we need to allow Graal to work will ship as part of normal Java 9. And it's been merged in and it's part of the early access um, builds, but it's not functional yet. I think it should be functional in the next early access build. And then you can get everything else you want via Maven. And how fantastic is this? We're getting a new JIT compiler to use on the, the standard hotspot, potentially via Maven or you could ship it with your application and bundle it in if you wanted to. Um, and of course you could modify it. You could use a different compiler using the same interface. Um, and if other people implementing JVMs wanted to, they could implement that same little stuff themselves potentially uh, and connecting Graal. So this again means that it should be um, reasonable to get people to start using this stuff uh, with JRuby at some point in the future. Um, and as I said, the, the current JDK9 early access builds aren't working, and you'd have to get everything else um, separately. So what you can also do is if you Google or any other search engine for OTN Graal, you'll find this page that lets you download a package we have called the Graal VM. That includes the JDK, includes Graal, and includes Truffle, and includes all the languages. And you literally have an executable, which is Ruby executable, or a JavaScript executable, and you can run them like that. So let's talk about how Truffle solves the problem of optimizing Ruby. We talked about several problems. Um, we said the first problem was that JRuby's core library is megamorphic. And we said that the, the, solu the solution that Truffle has for specializing ASTs helps us solve this. And then instead of having one version of each core library method, we can have many different versions that handle different types. So we have a type for, for adding which handles strings or doubles or integers or generics, and then we choose the, the most appropriate one. But we don't just get one 
It's like a polymorphic inline cache, in that if a, a location sees two different specializations being appropriately used, it can say, well, we use one or we use the other, and we'll choose a guard to, to choose between the two. Or it could use three, or it could decide to go to the generic. And if you decide to go to the generic, that might provoke it to split and generate multiple copies of them. Here's a bit more how this looks in practice, zooming in on the stuff you saw in the simple language one. We have these multiple versions of methods. So instead of having one method that handles anything, we now have multiple methods, each of which handles a particular set of types. And there's some more logic I'm not showing here that does things such as, for example, can automatically promote an integer to a long in order to meet a specialization. Um, or uh, various other things like that. We've got some annotations here that allow us to handle exceptional cases, such as when we add together two longs, Ruby has um, long integer semantics. So if you add together two integers and they would overflow, it will give you a long integer instead or a big integer. Um, and we can model that in Java using exact math or add exact. And we can tell Truffle that if you get this exception, stop it here and try using the next specialization instead. So we can sort of dictate what that lattice looks like. We can say, after you tried this one, if something went wrong, try the next one. So if add fails, because we get an arithmetic overflow exception, we'll try using this specialization instead, add with overflow, which turns them into big integers and then adds them together. And let's say this is like uh, multiple dispatch, if you like, or pattern matching. Multiple versions of each method um, that choose the appropriate types. This helps compilation because of each of these methods is much smaller and much simpler. So it isn't reasonable to expect Hotspot to compile that big megamorphic method that Joby had. But for these little methods, it is reasonable to expect Graal to optimize this simple little call here. We said that everything else, if the, if the types aren't what expected, it'll be a deoptimization, as Jill described. Is there a yeah. If you write bytecode, yes, but yeah. I don't think Java supports that. No. Okay. So I'm wondering what happens if your return types here are the same and they are the You simply give the method a different name. <coughs> the method names are meaningless. They're just there for the, your convenience as an implementer. And I get rewritten in the... Uh, yeah. Right, you write it, so. What actually happens is a, a truffle node is a Java class. And this, the, we call this the DSL with these annotations at specialization. We use code generation at compile time to generate a different class for each one of these. Um, we could call them truffle beans, I think, occasionally. They're like little Java objects that you can connect together to build something. The second problem we talked about was that Joey's core library is stateless. When you're inside a, a core library implementation in Java, you've got nowhere to store anything. And multiple people have talked here about the importance of caching and profiling. And that really is the biggest weapon we've got against these dynamic languages. And this implementation technique, the, the current one, provides nothing to do that. What we can do here is each of these truffle nodes is an instantiated object on the heap. And that means as well as having a method that allows you to execute some action, you can store things in it. So in our implementation of send in truffle, we have a specialization that is send and it's the, the object and the name of the method and stuff. There's some complexity in here. Um, don't worry about it too much. But one thing we can store is a call site. Call dispatch head node is our uh, complicated name for a call site in JRuby. And the at child simply says that it's a, a child node of this node. So I've got one node that does my send, and then I've got another node hanging off it, which is my inline cache for making method calls. So that means that I've got a inline cache I can use when I make this call. And that cache is the name for me. So this means I can turn a send node into a, a, a normal method call via an inline cache. Now you may be wondering, doesn't that mean that that, that will become generic very quickly? Um, well, the solution for that is we've got one copy of the send call library implemented using Truffle. Uh, multiple people are calling it. They're calling it with send bar or send foo. And in a big Ruby application, the amount of sends going on means there'll be thousands of these. And this, it looks like this will simply become generic very quickly. We've got an inline cache in it, but it's still a limited inline cache. But no, remember, Truffle can detect the cost of a node, and we'll see that that node is becoming more and more 
polymorphic, and then it will split it. So you'll get one copy of send for each call site that it's using it. So this one is specialised just for calling bar, and this one's specialised just for calling foo. And because of the name, if the name bar is a literal earlier in the method, then it's going to be a literal all the way down, and the only thing this will have to do is guard, is this literal what I expect it to be? Well, yes, it's a literal, so it's always going to be what I expect it to be. And the cost will go away, and there'll be zero overhead for using this dynamic sense. And most of this is happening automatically. I'm not having to split the nodes. Truffle is doing that automatically for me. And we can use this for other things. Again, it's not just about types, and it's not just about um, inline caching. This is our integer array builder node. So this is a node which helps you build up arrays. Um, and th this helps show you that nodes don't correspond always to simple things in the language. So it's not just an add node, a assign node. We can have lots of nodes to help us build things up. And this node helps us build up an array, and you can push things onto it. And one thing it stores, so as a field inside this truffle node, is the expected length of the array. And that means that when we allocate the array to start with, we can give it that expected length. And when we finish creating the array, if it's larger than the expected length, we can say, next time, create it with this extra space to start with because I think you're going to use that. So we can cache the expected size of the, the array here. And there's, when you start to implement a core library using this technique, there's a whole wealth of things you can cache. And you can start to do really advanced techniques uh, for example, V8 uses a technique called mementos at the moment, which um, helps you profile how long an object lives, and if it looks like it lives a long time, you can allocate it in the old generation to start with. And we can do something similar here. We did in the past where we, we stored a link back to the allocation site, which is a node, and then you can simply tell the node, I'm hanging around for a long time. You might as well allocate me in this different way. So any, th any kind of state you want, it, it's... It's an open field, you can, you can store your state in there. The third problem we talked about was the fact that uh, Jeremy's core library is very deep and you'd be a very long way down into this, this dense, dense Java code before you got anywhere. Truffle solves this because of it, it is going to, by default, compile through everything that is a node and anything that's an inline call to another Truffle method. Um, so in this case, I can guarantee we're going to compile from this into this, down into this. Um, and the model in Truffle is that by default you have to tell it to stop inlining. It will keep inlining as far as it can go. So you can guarantee the, your, the contents of your the implementation of your nodes will get inlined. And if you find that's too much, or the partial evaluator isn't able to do it, uh, for example, if it has unbounded recursion, then you can, you can tell it to stop. The fourth problem we had that was that JRuby's core library isn't amenable to optimizations. So we can have an implementation of something like sort, but it's not reasonable to expect Hotspot to compile something like sort as it is. This is the, the truffle version of sort. I'm just going to zoom in on this part, but there's a, a sort node that has a specialization for sorting short things. So I'll zoom in on this bit. I've used an annotation here in Truffle that says at, at explode loop. So I can tell Truffle, if there's a loop in here, I want you to completely unroll it. Explode because it's completely unroll it. Um, there's a few other little annotations like that. Um, you, can, you can, for example, force the optimization yourself using other annotations and methods. What I've got here is, I know that in Ruby we often have very small arrays, like in that clamp we had, which was abc.sort. So I thought we could implement specialization that handles those short ones easily. So I wrote a selection sort, which would normally be a great sort algorithm, and I made the loop a constant size, so the maximum size for a small array. And then I checked inside the loop the actual size of it to check it was still within bounds. Um, and I used my call node here to make a, a truffle call, and I can rely on um, truffle exploding this to be something that's not a loop, that simply has the body of it copied out many times. So that becomes quite a lot of code, it's true, um, but it means that it's all just simple code. When we get rid of all the loops and stuff, you simply have getting from an array, calling a compare, and then setting if we need to swap them. And that means that uh, Truffle and Graal are now able to optimize through this kind of stuff. 
and I'll show you the impact of it in a minute. So let's start with a simple example. And we'll get, uh, get crazy in a minute. So this is the implementation of min. So it's a bit like that clamp, but I've reduced it a little bit. So we have minimum of A and B. And we can do that by doing A, B, sort, and take the first one. Uh, and the code I'm using is I want to put, which means right to the string, minimum of two and eight. So let's walk through what Truffle and Graal are doing with this. The first thing we can do is we can inline min. And Truffle will do that automatically because it sees that the, the AST involved in the implementation in min is very, very simple. So it'll probably inline that without any kind of extra hinting. And indeed it does. So we have now just two, eight, sort, and take the first one. Now that sort routine, when you, ex when you inline it, when you explode the loop, the residual code is, is this. So we compare two and eight, and then T1 is, if T0 is less than zero, because it, it's a compare, so it gives you <coughs> minus one or plus one, depending on which uh, comparison it is. Then take the two or the eight, otherwise take the eight or the two, and then put them into the array in that sorted order, and then index it. We only do this for small arrays, keep in mind. It's not, not unbounded. We're doing it for arrays we know are small. Um, now we're taking the first element of the array, which is T1, so we don't need the T2, and no one's actually using the T3. So we can get rid of those, and we can just directly refer to the T1. This is what the partial evaluator is doing. It, it's seeing these things are, are constant and removing them. And we can, we can do that comparison manually, and then we can simply plug that variable in. We know that's true. And we simply get a result, and we simply put two. And that happens for real if you run that Ruby code. People say to me, though, programmers don't spend most of their time doing things just on constants. Uh, we, someone else said that when you do inlining and code generation and stuff like that, you do get some silly code that is obviously constant foldable. Um, but let's look at what happens if instead of it being literal values, it's A and B. We, we keep going as far as we can. So we say, we, we put that in there, and that's as far as we can go. So we can't completely constant fold it, but we've still achieved something here. We've still gotten rid of the allocation of the array. We've still gotten rid of the, the call, we're still inline stuff. This is called the residual program. And even if it's not a constant, we've still achieved a lot. And when you think about implementing a VM in a high-level way in Java, you have lots of temporary objects and things like that. So boxing, for example. If we've got an AST interpreter where the return type of execute is always object, then we're always boxing, but the partial value is seen through the boxing. And all we're left with is extremely efficient code. And when we were looking at the original Ruby code and thinking that was a silly way to write minimum, we've got now what is a good way to write minimum minimum in Ruby, and we've got that abstraction removed for free. Okay, let's look at a deliberately extreme example. So this is some code which I found actually worked um, without, I, I haven't engineered tiny little optimizations to make this work, but I have made the benchmark deliberately to show off things which I knew were working anyway. Um, so. Got quite a lot of code here. I'll zoom on, on bits of it individually. So you've got a, a module called foo, and it has a method foo taking a, b, and c. And I've just done a load of stuff in here that creates objects and processes things. So I create a, a hash of a, b, and c. I map that hash to get just the values out. I index that array. I create another array of a, b, c. I sort it, I take the middle one, and I add them together bar this other class, it's one of those classes which just forwards stuff. So I've got method missing, and it takes an array of arguments, and it checks if foo responds to it, then it sends it to foo, otherwise it doesn't do anything. And then the, the outer loop of this benchmark creates a new bar, and it simply does bar.foo. So that's that, that whole benchmark. So let's think about the control flow. Foo is called on bar, but it has no such method. So it forwards the method from this send, as well as calling respond to up to here. 
And the data flow is that the values are passed in here. They actually become allocated implicitly into an array here. And this is another part of the problem of these kinds of languages in that things are often allocated or called very implicitly. And there's often a lot of stuff going on there behind the scenes. So we actually create an array of the arguments here. And then we, in order to call it on send, we have to turn it from an array back into those arguments straight away. And then it goes up to, to foo. And then the, the values go all the way through this until they come back out to here. And then this returns presumably some value. And the value it returns is 22. If you sit down with pen and paper or, or run it, you'd find out that was the, the value of 22. This is how that performs on other implementations of Ruby. So again, taller is better. It's all relative to MRI, the implementation of Ruby and C. And this is four up here. And this is... JRuby running with Invoke Dynamic, and that's pretty respectable, four times faster. That's a really useful speed up. Rubinius is a bit slower. I think it has quite poor support for meta programming, the sends and stuff like that. Topaz does quite well here. I think there's some, some known things they just haven't done yet on the particular routines I'm using in Topaz there, so that's probably not Topaz at its best. Um, so, one way we can see what Joe Trough can do this is run this benchmark. And we are now a thousand times faster when you run this benchmark. And I said it was a deliberately extreme example. So what is happening here in reality is what you usually don't want to happen with a benchmark is that the whole thing is being optimized away. And the, the output of the compiler is that constant value, 22. So that's how we're able to run it so fast because we completely optimized the benchmark away. We can confirm that in several different ways. This is the, the Graal IR that comes out of that compilation. I've taken a screenshot of the, the actual tool we have for visualizing the Graal IR so you can see what we see as language implementers. Um, the, the IR is, as Gilles described, what we have here is a node. I think yellow nodes are side effecting and blue are side effect free. Is that right, Gilles? I don't know what the colors mean here. Some of them mean stuff. I don't know what they always mean. But we have, I do know that the, the red edges are control flow and the blue edges are data flow. Um, I'm going to zoom in here just on the bottom and by the way you read these graphs from bottom up if you didn't know that we have a return and we have box and the constant value 22 so we've reduced the whole thing to a constant now there is quite a lot of logic on the control flow path and the graph does continue up and up and up and up so there's a lot of things we have to check before we know the value 22 is, is the right result and you can see some here um, the values were 14 and 8 and stuff like that. And here you can see we're checking that the, the value we load from the argument is still 8 and is still 14. And if not, we're going to transfer back to the interpreter and do something else. Um, but as I say, we, we do reduce that constant value. And again, my what I'm saying to you is that even if it didn't reduce to a constant value, that's shown that we can do the best in the best case. And then if other things are still runtime values, then they just get left in where necessary. Um, and the, the guards aren't, obviously aren't far too much because of we were still a, a thousand times faster. So we know the guards are, are reasonable. And the final way we can check that this is being actually reduced to a constant is we can look at the, the generated machine code. Obviously there's quite a lot that generates the guards, but the, the important bits are there's a return instruction and there's move into the return register, this literal, and the literal is the, the already box value 22. And the JVM keeps around box versions of small integers. So we don't even allocate anything here. We simply return an already allocated value. So for all that complexity in that benchmark, which was comprised of these patterns I pulled out of these gems people are actually using to make money today, we can completely remove them. And the only way we've done that is by having these techniques to implement the core library, using specialization, using splitting, um, using the stuff that Truffle provides us. If we hadn't done that and we'd left the core library in as something that was opaque, either implemented in Java code that Hotspot can't optimize, or in C++, or in anything else, then we'd never have got anything like that. We'd be left with nothing more than lots of calls to runtime routines. I used to work on parallelism, and there's a, a law there, Amdahl's law, that says you can make your, your parallel part as fast as you can, you've still got the, the sequential part left. And it's a bit like that, and you can, even if we made calls to these intrinsics, take no time at all, it would still be really slow because of the actual core routines take so long. 
We were talking about core library and it being a barrier. We can take this to the next level if we talk about C extensions. Ruby, like Python, like V8, like many of these languages, support C extensions. So you can write code in the C and you can dynamically load that often into the interpreter and it gives you effectively new built-in functions that you call. And the, these are pretty essential for a pragmatic use of the language if you want to do things like talk to database using existing drivers. But they're also used to, to fix and to work around the, the performance problem. So if your, your Ruby code is too slow, you're told write a C extension. But the C extensions have got us in, uh, have painted ourselves into a corner and that they're written against an API which is very inflexible. And it's very hard to optimize the implementation of the language while still meeting the C API specification. Um, the people who wrote the JVM found this very early on. The original JNI equivalent was a exposed everything for real, like direct pointers, as Cliff talked about. And they went back and said, no, we need to abstract this. We need to add handles. But then that's adding overhead. Um, and in, in Ruby and, and Python, the C API has been a real limiting factor, I think, for alternative implementations of those languages. I think the, the PyPy people are, are working on it a lot at the moment, um, but it's a, a big problem. Ironically, JRuby, who suffer from this problem, have reinvented it for themselves in that their extension API in Java is just their entire internals exposed. So they complain about the Ruby C API, but we can't use their Java extensions because they've written against this, this massive API. And all of this has been about removing barriers to optimization. Then C extensions create a new barrier because it's more native code. So the people who wrote this clamp routine, they knew it was slow. I presume they profiled it and they, they realized it was slow, so they wanted to make a, a faster version. So they wrote a C extension. And it's written using this API where there's these opaque values, which are pointers to, to Ruby structs. And then they've written a nice high performance version of clamp that you and I might write if we were trying to write something that's high performance. But they use this inside this conversion from CMYK to RGB method, and they do lots of arithmetic, and they, they call clamp on each value. Um, but look at what else is going on around here. They're already creating a hash for to store the RGB components of the pixel. This is an image processing application running real-time producing images for people, and they're creating a hash of the RGB. They're mapping the key and value to clamp the value of each component, and then they're constructing another hash with those clamped values. So this map maps just the values inside the hash. We create two hashes, and we call this the C routine. And that's right in the middle, and it means that we've got another optimization barrier right in the middle. Every value is going into this black hole that's the C code that the compiler knows nothing about and coming back out again. What we're doing in Joby Truffle is we have implemented an interpreter for the C code for Ruby C extensions. I'm not going to talk about this idea in depth today because it's quite complicated. It may seem like it's a crazy thing to do to implement an interpreter for C. Um, C or C is a, a native language that uses direct access to memory. But if you look at C, it doesn't really have that much stuff that other languages we dynamically compile all the time do. It has if statements, it has functions, it has arrays. Those are all things we can dynamically compile using a, a conventional JIT compiler. When we prototyped this, we wrote a, a direct C interpreter. We're now putting it through LLVM. So we're compiling our C extensions to LLVM, and then we're interpreting LLVM IR as if it was a AST of a real language. So it's imagine if you had like LLVM IR written out like a basic program, and you interpret it. It's got uh, jumps and that sort of thing. It's a bit trickier in reality. Um, but then if we interpret it like that, then it means we can actually take that native util clamp method, and we can inline from where it's called into its truffle graph and back out again into if it calls back into Ruby. And this is something which has produced real results for us. We took all the C extensions for the, the PSD native and the PSD to RB and the chunky PNG, so that's the, the PNG and the Photoshop library, and took all the things they found it was important to write C extensions for, every one of them. So, we didn't choose these, someone else wrote them as C extensions. And we looked at running them on MRI, just the native Ruby code, 
And then with this, so just the, the Ruby code, and then with the C extensions, it's about 10 times faster on MRI. On Rubinius, there's a smaller margin, and on JRuby, there's a smaller margin, because of, they have to emulate that C API, and it's a nightmare to do. When we ran with the C extensions, we were able to achieve around three times faster than the native compiled code. And the reason for that is because we could inline it as one. We go from being a collection of really fast routines, just going backwards and forwards, calling each other the whole time, to one tight loot, all optimized together, partially evaluated into one really, really tight piece of machine code. And you can see that a large amount of the effect is um, the fact that we could inline between the two. Um, because if we, we disabled the cost language inlining and then performance was about the same as native. And again, this is real code people are using to make money today. So, conclusions. The blocker for the performance of idiomatic Ruby code that people want to run and that people have, not that we'd like people to write, is the core library, not the basic language features. So if you tackle a language like Ruby and you think, well, I'll implement strength reduction, I'll implement inlining, I'll implement this and that. If you don't implement the core library and leave it as an opaque box, then I don't think you'll get any more than a couple of times speed up. And this barrier extends to everything that, that gets in your way. So it's the core library, but it's also C extensions. And it's also other little languages that are embedded. For example, regular expressions. People often use those for really strange things in Ruby. And if they're a barrier, if you can't compile through the regular expressions, then um, that will limit your performance there. Specialization, splitting, inlining, partial evaluation, inline caching. They're all solutions to this problem. And... Truffle makes it easy to use them. It makes it easy to use them on the core library because our core library is everything's an object, everything can be cached in store state. And we found that this can result in order of magnitude increases in performance with reasonable effort. So for the first two years, there was one person working part-time on Joe Truffle. More recently, there's been a couple more, but we've surpassed all other Ruby implementations uh, with very reasonable effort. I need to make a couple of important acknowledgements. JRuby Truffle is built on the work of JRuby and Rubinius, and the JRuby people host us in their repository, so we're very grateful to them allowing us to do that. And the, the Graal VM team at Oracle Labs is large and always growing. This particular work on Ruby is joint work with me, Benoit Delos, who's here, um, Kevin Menard and Peter Halupa. Uh, the work on C extensions, which originally worked with Matthias Grimmer, but now with Manuel Riga, who's also here. And there's a large group of people who work on things like the Graal compiler and Truffle uh, who make what we're doing possible. Thanks very much.